Words at War. Good evening, sucker. Oh, no, no, don't look at him. It's you, I mean. <laughs> Think you're a wise guy, don't you? Catch you buying the Brooklyn Bridge or taking money out of your sock to pour it down a fake oil well. Yeah, my heyday is over. Bootleg gin, speakeasies, protective associations. All my racket's gone with prohibition. <laughs> Maybe, sucker. Maybe. Yeah, I'm still around and doing fine. Take this war now. It's got angles if you know how to work them. You call it a war for democracy. Well, that's okay with me. Call it what you like. Sucker. I ain't complaining. I'm getting mine out of it. <laughs> well, so long, sucker. I'll be seeing you. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents another program in the widely discussed series, Words at War. Tonight, our story, dealing with the enemies on the home front, is based on the book by Harry Lieber and Joseph Young, Wartime Racketeers. Ted Osborne is the narrator. We're facing a fact tonight. The ugly fact that Americans are paying billions a year in tribute to the wartime racketeer. The whole crew of them, the swindlers, the hijackers, the gunmen, are out to line their pockets with your earnings, Mr. and Mrs. America. Not in a dark alley at the point of a gun. That's pre-war technique. The gangster 1945 style operates in broad daylight. You may meet him in the corner meat market or grocery store. You may rub elbows with him in a crowded railroad station. Mr. But my friends are expecting me. I've got to get to Chicago. I've got to. at the station master's office. I'm sorry, all trains for the are completely sold out. Next. Oh, I'd like what one am I people. going to do? Oh, uh, pardon me, madam. Uh, you want a reservation to Chicago? Do I? You have one to sell? On the century for tomorrow for a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? That's what I said, lady. But that's twice as much as I... I mean, well, after all... Excuse I... me. I thought you had to get to Chicago. Did she buy that ticket? Was she one of those Americans who figured she was an exception? That wartime sacrifice was fine for other people? The government request that civilians avoid all unnecessary trips did not apply to her? She knows, as you and I know, that all trains are needed to bring the wounded home and that to speed VJ Day, troops must be carried to the Pacific coast. Was her trip so urgent that she had to buy a ticket on the black market? You're nuts. What's that? Just me, sucker. I told you I'd be seeing you. Sure, me and my pals are doing business at the railroad stations, at the meat market, and the grocery stores, too. It's a free country, ain't it? People want to buy from us, it's their business. They got the money to spend, sure. They got money to burn. Yes, my scummy compatriot, you're right. Americans have money to spend today. Fourteen billion dollars more spending money than before the war. But what about it, Mr. and Mrs. America? Do you want to put that money into war bonds to speed the victory over Japan, or do you want it to go into the pocket of this character here, the wartime gangster? According to Price Administrator Bowles, every time the housewife goes to shop, between 3 and 4% of the price she pays for food goes to the black marketeer. In food alone, America is giving the gangster a yearly bonus of $1,200,000,000. <laughs> Sounds big, don't it? <laughs> Look, peanuts, just peanuts, just part of my take. Look, if you're smart, you can work this war a hundred different ways and pick up plenty of change in the process. Listen, eh, somebody's typing. That's an innocent sound, isn't it? You hear it every day in your office. Well, I got a pal who can use a typewriter, too. Uh, he's the kind that likes to work alone. His equipment is simple. Typewriter, stationery, stamps, a casualty list, and an address. George, dear, will you come here, please? Mm, uh, what is it, dear? This letter, there's something strange about it. Uh, let's see it. Seems to be from some sporting goods company in Chicago. Mm, yeah, it's a dun to Jim. Payment long overdue. Golf bag, clubs, 
tennis racket. Doesn't sound like Jim to have let a bill that big run so long. No, it doesn't. But you know how I used to love tennis. You remember any of this stuff around the house? No. Oh, maybe he bought it while he was stationed at Great Lakes. Yeah, could be. What do you think, George? Should we pay it? Yeah, what else can we do? I wouldn't want anyone to think our boy didn't meet his obligations. So Jim's parents sent the check for the phony bill without question. Anything to avoid the hint of a blemish on their boy's memory. Biographical sketches of war heroes published in the paper give the racketeer the key to his victim's hobbies. Rarely does he make a slip. Yes, the fraud through the mail boys are doing a flourishing business these days. Here's another one of their favorite form letters in action. Mother, mother, Franklin's going to be in a book. It, it says so in this letter. For heaven's sakes, dear, how exciting. Listen, your husband was posthumously decorated for gallantry. His brave deeds are to be perpetuated forever in a commemorative book. This handsome, illuminated, leather-bound volume is modestly priced at ten dollars. Oh, Mother. Modestly priced at ten dollars. The book, if the family receives it at all, will be, at best, a shoddy collection of newspaper stories of soldiers. And here's still another letter racket, streamlined for war. And if you have a loved one among the millions of fighting men who will soon be meeting the Japs in the Pacific, you may well be a target for this kind of pious and plausible approach. Dear friend, see that your loved one goes into battle protected by the divine guidance of a bulletproof Bible. Repeated tests have shown our steel covers will deflect a forty-five caliber service revolver bullet shot from any angle. True or false? Well, the Federal Trade Commission looked carefully into that claim and promptly took action against the firm which made it. For this is what the experts found. Steel jacketed Bibles afford a serviceman no protection whatsoever against bullets and shrapnel. On the contrary, the jagged holes left in the Bible by projectiles passing through them increased the risk of serious and painful wounds. It's bitter, isn't it? In trying to bring spiritual solace and physical protection to your combat soldier you may be tricked into placing his precious life in even greater jeopardy. Bitter and tragic. Ah, uh, take it easy. After all, it takes all kinds to make a world, even a world at war. And it takes two guys to make a deal. A salesman and a customer. <laughs> now, take, for example, some of us boys have got a little finger in the gasoline. Pit. A little finger? You're in the gasoline business up to your armpits. At least 2,500,000 gallons of gasoline every day are being drained from the crucial civilian and military supply. That's the unholy alliance of gangsters, counterfeiters, and dishonest station operators. Uh-uh-uh, you forget what I said about it takes two to make a deal. <laughs> what about the motorists? They're in this, too. Yes, unfortunately, the motorists are in this, too. That'll be 1080, sir. 1080? Well, there must be some mistake. I only have coupons for three gallons. Who said anything about coupons? I filled her up that I was doing you a favor. Oh. Oh. Thanks, buddy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> we wouldn't be in business unless we had customers. How true. In facing facts tonight, we might as well face this one, too. We can pass laws to ban the black market. We can create agencies to enforce the law. But as long as part of the public, any part of the public, is willing to deal with a black marketeer, he's going to stay in business. The operator of a gas station knows he's taking a chance in selling gas without demanding coupons. If he's caught, he may be fined or sent to jail. Hey, you're making it sound hard. That's not so tough. He knows if he's smart in picking his customers... If no one reports him to the OPA, he'll get by. <laughs> and he doesn't worry about turning in coupons for gas, either. Yeah, <laughs> he's got plenty. Where's he get them? Wait. Oh, yes. Thanks for reminding us. Do you hear that? Printing press is at work. Working against you. Working against all America. Working overtime to flood the nation with phony ration stamps for shoes, sugar, meat, gas. The masterminds of gangsterdom need these goods for the black market. There's a fortune in it for them. 
the evil of inflation and higher living costs for you. What about the 22 million counterfeit red points unearthed recently from beneath the floor of a Brooklyn flat? 22 million were the men who printed those stamps engaged in hopeful speculation, or did they know their market? Had they sized up correctly the cynicism with which some Americans regard the rules of war at home? Of course, it's no concern of the racketeer if your children get sick on black market poultry, or your family falls victim to trichinosis from the infested tissue of illicit pork. Oh, they're well organized, these gangs. They know their business well. <laughs> sure they do. They're smart cookies. They're no saps. Yes, but they sometimes slip. Oh, yeah? Yes. Sometimes they contact the wrong man. Oh, well. Rather not hear it? Let's do. Listen to a case on record. It's true. It happened. In a little New England town. Mr. Williams, this is Mr. Hill. Oh, uh, come in, come in. How do you do, sir? Sit down, won't you? Thank you. I don't know, maybe I should have gone to the OPA instead of coming here to Secret Service, Mr. Williams. I'll see the OPA. What's it all about, Mr. Hill? Well, it ain't much, except I just didn't like the smell of it. Cyrus Bingham, he's another printer in town, came to see me today. Uh, so? Well, seems he had a big job and can't handle it all in his shop. The long and short of it is he... He offered me easy money if I'd print counterfeit ration stamps. Oh? And you turned him down? No. And I didn't take him up. I, I stole him off. Well, uh, wasn't he suspicious? No. He expected it. He's always telling me I'm too cautious for my own good. I reckon he didn't expect me to come here either. Thinks I'm too cautious for that, too. Oh, Mr. Hill, you may have something there. If uh, if we can work this so it leads us to a counterfeit ring... Oh, that... I, I don't think Cyrus Bingham is the head of a counterfeit ring. <laughs> he hasn't brains enough for that. Well, I'm just wondering if you might lead us to some of the top men. Their label artists, for instance. The engravers in this racket are the slippiest babies to catch. Is that a fact? Yes. I got a friend in New York who's an engraver. Name of Carlson. Specializing in counterfeiting? No, no, I didn't mean that. Carlson's an honest man. I just thought he might help you out. Mm, I doubt it. But wait a minute. Does Cyrus Bingham know this engraver friend of yours? Well, Cyrus knows Carlson's work, but well, they never met. Carlson won't ever leave New York to pay me a visit. <laughs> Says the quiet of a small town makes him nervous. Hmm. But the kingpin of a counterfeit ring might come to a small town to meet a good engraver. Do I look anything like your friend Carlson, Mr. Hill? No. For one thing, his shoulders are too broad. Carlson may have to have broad shoulders for a few hours. Uh, that is, if you're willing to cooperate with the OPA and Secret Service on a plan. How many more blocks, Sergeant? About five, Mr. Williams. We turn right the next corner, then we're practically there. Only a few minutes to go, Mr. Hill. Yes, sir. I darn need matches anyway. A little nervous, are you? Oh, no, I just can't get this pipe lit. But I ought to be nervous. Never been arrested before. Cyrus Bingham and the bird behind him are more apt to talk to you if you and I are picked up as part of their gang. They won't know where the leak is then. I only hope they won't keep me long at the police station. My wife didn't like my coming to the shop instead of going to church on Sunday morning. If I'm not on time for dinner, she'll raise Cain. Well, don't you worry. You won't even miss the suit. This it, Mr. Hill? Yep, this is my shop. All right, men. All out. Now, uh, Mr. Hill... Just show the sergeant and his men that back room of yours. Can you still hear me in the other room when I speak in this voice? Yes, sir. Let's check the queue. What is it again? I'll be taking the noon train back to New York. Right. Hmm, it's 11 o'clock. They ought to be here. You're sure Bingham didn't suspect a trap when you told him you wanted to meet the big boy himself? Oh, I'm positive he didn't. He thought it was my cautious nature. And just like me to want to meet the man who was going to pay for the job. Quiet. Here they come. Well, hello, Cyrus. Good morning, Bert. Mr. Antoine, Mr. Hill's the printer I was telling you about. I'm uh, glad to know you, Mr. Antoine. Uh, meet my friend, Mr. Carlson. Oh, yes, the engraver. <laughs> That's right. Are you a good engraver, Mr. Carlson? I've had 20 years to prove it. Tell me, could you copy exactly the Great Seal of the United States? I can try. Mr. Hill has some samples of my work. Yes, right here on the table. Hmm. 
Yes, not bad. The work of a craftsman, at least. You are responsible for these reproductions, Mr. Hill? I am, sir. You work well together, hmm? I like that. I appreciate good work. And I pay well for it. Very well. I'm willing to give you $1,000 now and 9000 more when the job is delivered. Is that agreeable to you, gentlemen? Well, that's all right with me. I'll guarantee my work will fool any expert. Be a Bert Hill printed on the right paper stock. Mr. Bingham will see to that. We have ample supplies of specially processed paper, um, shall I say, borrowed from the government. Does the government help you in distributing the stamps, too? Unfortunately, no. Since we are competitors, they will not cooperate in marketing them for us. We have our own wholesale distributors. Oh, you have? Your work is not in that department, Mr. Carlson. We do not encourage probing. Well, that suits me. The less I know about this business, the better. All I want is my cut of that 10000 I'm glad to leave all the details to Hill. In fact, if there's nothing else, I'll be taking the noon train back to New York. All right, hey. boys. Hey. Get him up. Hey, hey. hey. see here. Yeah, what is this? That goes for you, too. But, my dear fellow, I'm a stranger here. I don't know what this is all about, I'm sure. You heard what I said. Get your hands up. For well, what for? That's more like it. I suppose all of you file out quietly to the car in the alley. Well, I know. Be too bad to spoil the Sunday peace. Mr. Hill missed church that Sunday, but by leading the OPA to two men involved in the counterfeit racket, this printer in a little New England town performed a valuable service to his country. With his help, a counterfeit ring was smashed before it could produce and circulate its handiwork. So what? That's one case, sure, but just one. (laughs) Just a drop in the bucket. Unfortunately, true. Now, the general public and the families of servicemen are not the only targets for the war racketeer. G.I. Joe himself is on their list. Not long ago, two sailors found that out the hard way in a pub in Liverpool. Say, cut out that humming, will you? Why? I like the tune. There's nothing wrong with the tune, only my wife sings it. Your gal knows that song? I'll say she does. Last thing she sang to me. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's my gal's theme song, too. Yeah. Gee, I'd sure give a lot to see her again. We was married six months ago, just before I shipped out from Norfolk. Norfolk? Well, that's where I met my gal. Yeah? I never believed in love at first sight till it happened to me. <laughs> we got hitched there about eight months ago. Huh. If I could just hear her voice just once over the phone. Yeah, it sure would be nice. Oh, boy. Hey, you want to see a picture of my wife? Okay. Hey, of course you don't do her justice, but... Hey, take a look. Isn't she a honey? Sure, sailor. She... Hey, well, let me get a better look at that. Who are you? Two time and last, I'll knock your block. You going crazy? Hey, give me back that picture. I will not. That's my wife. What? Are you nuts? All right, yeah, come on. Give boy, me that. Break, break it up. Break it up. Break it up. You heard me? Break it up. Now, listen. Now, cut it. Oh, short patrol. Stay out of this. This is personal. Yeah, I'll say it is. That gob stole my wife's picture. Your wife? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I suppose this is a picture of your wife, too. Well, I'll... And in a bathing suit. Yeah. Hey, where'd you get it? Where'd I get it? Say, that guy ought to be locked up. With my own camera, I take a picture of my wife. Hey, you say he... that again, I'll let you have All it. All right. right. So help me. Now, Give listen, me you two. Picture. Cut it. Let's see those snaps. Wow. Mm. Some chassis. Yeah, it's the same pickup, girl. All right. Pickup? She's my wife. Your wife? She's my wife. All right. Don't stop it. it. Now, stop it. You gobs don't look very bright, but you ought to be able to dope this one out. Oh, you're wasting your time. That's enough out of you. <laughs> the only thing wrong with you guys is you're both married to the same dame. What? It's impossible. What's impossible about it? Ain't either of you ever heard of allotment Annie? So that's Madge Adair. The queen of the hot spots. That's her. We'll arrest her as soon as she finishes that song. She's just a kid. Don't look more than 17 to me. Not much older than that, probably. This babe is a smooth operator. The Office of Dependency Benefits was just getting wise to her when they got a Navy report confirming their suspicions. Let's get ready. Man, 
sugar. Let's get out of here. Just a moment, Mr. Dare. Now make way, civilian. Imagine me in a hurry. I got a date with the parson. Oh, Ray, honey, don't shout it to all the world. Why not, baby? I'm proud of it. I want the whole blooming world to know. But it was to be our secret. Secret marriages are rather in your line, aren't they, Mr. Well, Dare? I don't know what you're talking about. Two of your husbands met by accident recently. How dare you? Ray, let's get out of here. One moment, Mr. Dare. You recognize this badge? Perhaps you do, sailor. Oh, but look here, right? Miss Sedare is under arrest. Oh, but she can't be. She's my girl. That's right. You tell them, Ray, darling. We'll get married. Miss Sedare marries easily, sailor, without benefit of divorce. We have evidence that Miss Sedare is drawing seven allotment checks a month from servicemen. Do you want to be the eighth? Magic. Is that true? Oh, don't believe them. Why would I do a thing like that? Answer me. Is it true? Ray, don't don't look like that. You you scare me. Oh, you're the only one I really love. Honest, honey, I... Uh, Ray! He... He's gone! Oh, well, say la guerre. <laughs> That's French. Yeah. Suppose you come along quietly now, Miss Adair. What's the hurry, boys? I want to fix my face. It pays to look nice. Don't you think so? <laughs> And that's allotment, Annie. Very often the product of a broken home, lack of religious training, of too zealous a pursuit of happiness. She continues to trip blithely up church aisles, but sooner or later she trips and falls into the arms of the FBI. Uh, she's just an amateur. She don't know from nothing. The guy that's really cashing in is a misery jip artist. Oh, yes. I was coming to him. He hits a new low of contemptibility. Uh, for once, I'm almost inclined to agree with you. Well, even you. The stock in trade of the misery jip artist is human suffering. His technique is a personal visit to the family of a man in service. Uh, good morning, uh, Mrs. Tremont. Yes. Allow me to introduce myself. Uh, Lieutenant Hitchcock. Oh, uh, come in, Lieutenant. I came to see you about your son. Oh. You are the mother of Private John Tremont, are you not? You you know my son. I have news of him. Oh, do sit down. No, no, no. Sit there in that chair. It's more comfortable. Oh, thank you. I haven't heard from my son for three weeks. Is he well? Do you know if he got the box of cookies I sent him? Well, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing your son, Mrs. Tremont. The War Department sent me here today. Uh, Mrs. Tremont, your son fell in action somewhere in Germany. Uh, uh, no. I know it's no. a great shock. I, I wish there were some way I could help. Uh, yes, I... But he was so young. Never to see him again. That's... It's been hard for me to tell you this, Mrs. Tremont. There's so little one can say in a time like this. But uh, if it would comfort you to have your son at rest near you instead of some foreign land... Uh, oh, oh! if that were only possible. As a matter of fact, it is possible. The War Department is helping families bring our fallen heroes home for a nominal sum. I, I don't quite understand. The $100 covers the cost of preparing the body for burial and bringing it home. In every case, our government is willing to contribute half that amount if the next of kin pays for the other 50. $50? Yes, it's uh, not in any way obligatory, Mrs. Tremont. Your decision is entirely up to you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. I I suppose you want the money right away. Oh, not necessarily. If it's difficult for you, if you don't happen to have it in the house. Oh, but, but I do. I have it. Thank heavens, I do have it. It's right here in this candy jar. I've emptied my purse into it at the end of every week. I was saving it for him to help him get started on a career. It's grown a lot. Nearly sixty dollars. Fifty is all the War Department asked, Mrs. Tremont. Uh, yes, so you said. Oh. Oh, what's this? Oh, uh, just a temporary receipt for the money, Mr. Oh, Truman. but really, Lieutenant, that, that's not necessary. No, perhaps not, but I prefer you have it. You'll receive an official receipt from Washington in a few weeks. Will... Will it be very long before they send him home? Yeah, I, I hope not, Mr. Tremont, for your sake. I promise you I'll do everything in my power to bring your boy back to you as soon as possible. <laughs> Mr. 
Major Riley, the report on Private John Tremont has arrived. Oh, good, Sergeant. <laughs> That's as I thought. Sergeant, take a wire to his mother. Yes, sir. Mrs. Harold Tremont, Monroe, Michigan. I'm pleased to inform you that your son is alive and well. Urge you to report to police full details of visit and money transaction with so-called lieutenant. He is undoubtedly an imposter. The armed forces never solicit money for hospital or funeral expenses. Signed, Peter Riley, Major. And, uh, Sergeant. Yes, Major Riley? See that copies of Mrs. Tremont's letter are rooted to all the proper agencies. The FBI especially may want to question her. She may give them a clue helpful in finding this... this human scum. Scum. It's an ugly word. But not ugly enough to describe the type of man who thrives on the grief and suffering of others. But they exist, these traffickers in pain and death. They are part of the army of crooks who have fattened on the war. G.I. Joe goes fighting on. He, with his allies, has won victory over the international gangsters of Berlin. He'll keep fighting till the gangsters of Tokyo lay down their arms. But what about the homegrown variety? Will it ever be unconditional surrender for them? What do you think, sucker? All right. You tell us. Why not? You ask for it. Me and my pals are keeping up with the times. We're pretty busy these days figuring things out our own way. I tell you, this burial rack, it's been overworked. You've got to angle it differently. Missing men, that's a ticket. Bringing glad tidings from missing men. It's a cinch. Now that VE Day's over, folks want their boys home, not policing some hellhole in Europe or some sandbar in the Pacific. You can't go wrong with a new aid to veterans organization, a whirlwind campaign for funds, and then scram. <laughs> It's going to be the biggest rummage sale in history. Surplus housing, airfields, industrial equipment. You're telling me. I aim to get in on it. <laughs> you get it? We didn't get no Gilead's invitation at the San Francisco conference. But we're thinking of the peace. Thinking plenty. Well, so long. I'll be seeing you. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> How about it, Mr. and Mrs. America? Will he be seeing you? We're tracking down the war criminals in Europe. But what about those on the home front? They're making their post-war plans now. It's not enough to be indignant. It's not enough to say there ought to be a law. We have laws now to drive them out of business. But in the last analysis, it's squarely up to you and me, the ordinary citizen. Without us, the racketeers and jip artists simply couldn't operate. Working together, we won the war against Hitler and his gang. We're going to win the war against Japan. And by working together, we can win the home front war. We can free our country of racketeers. We can win the battle for America. Tonight on Words at War, you heard a dramatization based on a book by Harry Lever and Joseph Young, Wartime Racketeers. The radio version was written by Maxine Wood and featured Ted Osborne and Chuck Webster. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Garnet Garrison. Next week, we present a story suggested by the book Soldier to Civilian. Words at War is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcast.